Welcome back everyone live here at theCUBE in Barcelona for MWC, Mobile World Congress. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We have a special guest analyst host, Aziz Carvella. Aziz, great to see you. Hey, Thank always you. great to be Let's on theCUBE. Let's put this together. We've got the esteemed CUBE alumni, Rami Rahim, CEO of Juniper Networks, soon to be HPE with the acquisition, not yet closed, but great to have you back on theCUBE. It's been great a to be of, here. It's been the New York Minute. Thank uh, you. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate it. It's been too long. Well, Zia's put this panel together, I appreciate that Zia. Yeah. So let's get into it. So my first question uh, before Zia takes it over is, <laughs> the innovation around silicon, the innovation around AI and networking with your acquisition of MIST has been really kind of pointed to as the future, and we actually brought up an opening segment here, that that's the kind of thing you're going to start to see with AI. Yeah. AI for networking and networking for AI. It's an area that has been waiting to be innovated for in the cloud native world. It's like the last piece of the puzzle. Right. On cloud native. But yet the AI native world is coming super fast. So yeah. what does that all mean? What, do you, what, what is your perspective on this? What is AI for networking and what is networking for AI? What does that mean? Yeah. Okay, it's a great question to start with. And let's start with AI for networking because that's actually an area where we have invested and seen like incredible progress. And I know there are a lot of people at the show that are talking about AI. We're delivering on AI. And we're delivering in a way that's actually uh, provided incredible financial results for Juniper. Last year, our AI-driven networking business grew 70% year over year from the year before. How do we do this? We're offering solutions to our customers that essentially transform the way they interact with their networks. It's reducing the cost of running networks, it's enabling them to, dip, to delight the end user with an exceptional experience. All of this is being accomplished by replacing human effort with artificial intelligence that's delivering value in, uh, day in and day out transition to the next big opportunity that we are pursuing at Juniper, and that's more around networking for AI. Here, you have to understand that AI doesn't just appear out of thin air. AI has to be uh, offered from rich, high-performance infrastructure. This is where silicon high-performance software comes into play to enable uh, AI for the variety of applications that we see around the globe today. Both of these opportunities are multi-billion dollar opportunities for Juniper that we are pursuing. How big do you think that those opportunities are though? If you think about the five-year TAM, I've heard networking for AI alone be uh, anywhere from five billion to 20 billion. So right. if you think of those two as separate markets, how, yeah. how would you size the five-year TAM on those? So the, the AI for networking, essentially replacing human effort in running day-to-day -day networks into robots, software running these networks, it's as big as the TAMs are today because if you think about our campus and branch, that's a $25 billion TAM. Data center is also 20 to $25 billion. There's $50 billion of total addressable market that is ripe for disruption by applying artificial intelligence to the management control, day-to-day -day operations, reduction of trouble tickets, simplification and delighting the end user. The newer opportunity, Zeus, is on the networking for AI, that's around offering these high performance data centers to enable um, artificial intelligence. There, I've heard the TAM is today roughly around a couple of billion dollars. I'm specifically talking about Ethernet because yeah. the technology of choice today is still InfiniBand. Yeah. We expect that's going to transition rapidly to Ethernet over time. I've heard predictions of eight billion dollars within three years. That's a massive opportunity, and it's rare that you see markets grow that fast. On the, hold on, real quick on the InfiniBand Ethernet question. We're seeing InfiniBand for purpose-built clusters, yeah. and Ethernet much more for a broader market. Is that how you see it? Because there's people are discussing, is InfiniBand only right. for specific architectures or clusters, or yeah. will it prevail on the open side at scale? What do you, I mean, what's the difference? Where, where's the trade-off? Yeah, uh, well, uh, let's face it, InfiniBand and Ethernet are competing for the same addressable market Absolutely. inside the AI data center no question. opportunity. <laughs> and we've been talking about this a long time, right? Ethernet, Eden away, InfiniBand, but it hasn't happened, so convince me it's yeah. going to happen this time. Well, <laughs> it, I don't know how long we've been talking about it. I do believe it will, it's just a matter of time, and it really comes down to economics. When you have a number of different technology providers Juniper, Cisco, Arista, others that are all competing and innovating, 
to address this opportunity in an open way. It's just a matter of time before Ethernet starts to become a superior technology to InfiniBand from an economic standpoint, from a speed of innovation standpoint. I think it's already happening. As we get into 400 gig and 800 gig, I, I don't know, well, I even think Nvidia's InfiniBand will that, be left behind. Even, Infinit even NVIDIA's in that mix doing Ethernet. That's right? true, <laughs> that's, that's true, but you know what, game on. Uh, at the end of the day, I believe that those that bring to the table the best solutions from the silicon, the software, the automation capabilities, the visibility, will ultimately win this market, and we're in it to win it. Well again, you add them to the list, because it's obvious that yes. InfiniBand is the open standard. I want to come back to when you were talking about the market. Is there an analog to cloud? When you think about the cloud market, it, the, the infrastructure market, let's, call it, let's say it was 100 billion, maybe it was 200 billion, whatever number you choose. And then AWS made famous the, the line, undifferentiated, uh, heavy lifting, and they basically replaced a lot of human labor. It sounds like you're doing a, a lot of that with AI for networking. Yeah. A lot of journalists freak out about, oh, losing jobs, and it's, a, it's an important conversation. But did the, did the cloud, it replaced some human, a lot of human labor, but it didn't, the market didn't shrink. I mean, yeah. people didn't lose jobs because of it. Is there an analog there with AI yeah. for networking? You know, as I, travel around the world, as I am doing right now, uh, and, ta and talking to IT professionals, CTOs, CIOs, there is a common theme of the kinds of challenges that they are facing. Number one is a skill shortage. Number two is a talent shortage. Number three is typically 70 to 80% of the effort that is um, you know, exercised by their team at any given time is not going into innovation, it's not going into yeah. avoiding the disruption that's happening from their competitors, it's going into rudimentary keeping the lights off, uh, on, just keeping the network running. And we believe that job should be solved, should be accomplished by the robots, not by human beings, so that we can free up the time of human to actually work on digital transformation efforts and uh, actually innovative new capabilities and revenue generation opportunities that is what AI is, ha uh, is solving yeah, today. My, my advice to IT pros right now is if, if you're doing things as part of your job that aren't core to your res that aren't going to advance your resume, yeah. forget about what it means to the company. If you're doing things that won't advance your resume, stop doing them. Yeah. <laughs> and or, the only or, way to stop doing them is to automate them out of your job. Or the quality of their work. If they're yeah. grinding away, <laughs> they can, that toil they just, that the machines do, if they can move to yeah. higher value piece, pieces of work. Um, and but I think Dave's point's a good one though because there's far more compute engineers today than there were pre-cloud, right? And if you think of with hybrid work and IoT and things like that, there, we're going to need more network engineers. Yeah. And, but we can't continue to run the networks with the way we did before by hunting and pecking at CLI, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Look, yeah. I, uh, it might change the nature of the work, yeah. but it doesn't eliminate the need yeah. for the work. I, I, I honestly believe that Every customer that has seen the light, basically there were a lot of skeptics about AI when we, have, when we first started to offer MIST. Today, we've off, we're offering MIST across all aspects of networking from wireless to wired to WAN to security. Every customer that has seen this has walked away absolutely thrilled and delighted because it has simplified their life and it has made, given them so much more time to focus on what's actually truly important in their yeah, business. Yeah, we did, we did a panel on, on theCUBE with Bob Friday and the folks over there on the team in 2019, unpacking AI at that point. So you guys saw it early, congratulations, great investment, it panned out, and it's, a, it's, it's leading the industry conversation of the future of operationalizing yeah. some of these abstraction layers and automating with the human, um, very key. The question I want to ask you is, at what point did you realize that the data was very valuable and that you can go there? And then the second part of that question is, as telco, and this is kind of a telco enterprise show, let's just be, it's a cloud data show for telcos and enterprises. Yeah. What's the value of the data? Because people here are trying to assess, what data do I own? What data is available? And if I own my data, what IP is that? So yeah. when did you realize you had the magic in the data? And then how do customers figure out how to use their data right. in networking? Right. So, I mean, AI obviously thrives on data. Uh, if you don't have the data, the AI is actually quite useless. And in fact, the big differentiator in the MIST solution is not the AI algorithms themselves, although we have some amazing data scientists that are you know, implementing <laughs> these uh, algorithms in amazing ways. However, 
It's the ability for MIST to consume vast amounts of data and store it in a scale-out manner in the cloud, like basically infinitely scalable across the largest networks in the world. Only then can you apply the algorithms and then close the loop with real-time response to add value to the end user. Without data, none of this would work. So that's a data flywheel right there. You got that going on. I love the term flywheel because just like people talk about the network effect where networks become sort of exponentially more valuable as you add more and more users, I believe that there's a similar flywheel effect with data. As you accumulate data, you learn from that data, you gain insights from that data. It allows you to enhance the product. When you enhance the product, what happens? Your customers are happier, you get more customers. With more customers, what happens? You get more data. And that is a positive flywheel effect that's incredibly powerful that's driving our business I th today. I think the other uh, underappreciated aspect to MIST though, and we talked about a little bit about this morning, is MIST the, was founded in an era where cloud native was becoming yeah. the norm. Yeah. Where if you look at a lot of your competitors, yeah. uh, and it's not, nothing against the competitors, but when they created those products, there really wasn't the concept of cloud native. So that was more the analogy of they took a controller and they did a lift and shift into the cloud, yeah. which is different than what you have, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. We have the advantage of a, an amazing team, but also the advantage, as you mentioned, Zeus, of time. Yeah. We, were, we invented this solution, the MIST team invented the solution at a time that cloud native backends actually existed, yeah. and that has given us a massive moat right now around the solution. I also want to address your question about what does it mean for telcos, because yeah. it's really yeah. important. Well, at the end of the day, they we're at Marvel of Congress. <laughs> there are a lot of telcos <laughs> here that are looking at the missed success and asking how do they uh, take advantage of it. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, there is no reason why you can't apply the AI ops capabilities to a telco network. We've already expanded MIST from being a primarily Wi-Fi solution into Wi-Fi wired WAN and security. We can include wide area routing, and we will include wide area uh, routing. Second, I do believe on the other aspect of AI, which is more about networking for AI, the edge of the network, right? Whether it be in the central office or on, in the enterprise, is still white space. It's still an opportunity for telcos to come in there and offer edge services, potentially with AI inferencing as a new revenue uh, stream generation yeah. uh, approach in their, in so their business. So how do they feel about that? Because if you look at all the cycles we've had, and Dave, you mentioned a few cloud and, you know, and trends like that, telcos really were scared of the technology, yeah. right? late to adopt cloud, late to adopt software, and they missed out on the opportunity to be able to monetize that, right? Yeah. Today, when you look at edge yeah. and AI, are, are they on board with that? Do you think their, their mindset's actually in a place where these mythical new revenue generating yeah. services will actually be realized? Uh, I, I, think, I think that's the case. I don't think everybody believes it, but you only need a few telcos to provide an example. And I view our role at Juniper Networks as an enabler, as somebody that we can work and partner with our telco yeah. partners to show that this is in fact an approach that can drive new revenue uh, streams for them. I mean, the data, the data between networks, whether it's private 5G or private hybrid public yeah. private networks on mobility, and then you got the telcos have all the data, yeah. uh, not just customer data, network data. Yes. So imagine putting a foundation model around that. Yeah. That's I, where they could have a net new business model. Definitely a data play here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a whole nother data play <laughs> for the... Telcos <laughs> are sitting on a gold mine of data about their customers. They, they don't know how to get yeah, that to say, the customer you, though. If That's you can get problem. to that data, right. <laughs> <laughs> they know they're sitting on a gold mine, they don't know how to get it out. I, I, there, there, are, there is a way to it. get to the yeah. data and to leverage that data, and they're also sitting on prime beachfront property for edge cloud services, right? Central offices and the relationships that they have with their enterprise customers. All of the components, all of the pieces are there. They just need to be combined, assembled, and, and formed into an amazing offering. I think it's possible. Antonio was on earlier today and talking about the edge opportunity. Can you help us help understand the rationale for the, the acquisition, irrespective of the financial outcome, which yeah. is incredible. I'd love for you to take us inside the boardroom, which you probably won't, but <laughs> what were your strategic alternatives that you thought about? I mean, you, you could have made some other big moves that were super risky, I'm sure. You know, HPE, the same. I mean, they've yeah. made a lot of little tuck-ins. This is a big move for them. Yeah. Explain the rationale and what it means for customers. Yeah. So, 
you know, Juniper was born in the era of the internet, and we bet big that IP networking was going to create this massive global network, and ultimately that bet paid off. Fast forward to today, the big inflection of our time is artificial intelligence, and I believe that incremental moves towards capturing this market opportunity are not going to be sufficient. You need bold moves, and this is an example of a bold move. This combination of HPE and Juniper is incredibly exciting to me, and honestly, in talking to many of our customers, very exciting to, to them as well. We have an ability here to take the innovation that comes from both sides across compute, storage, networking, in pretty much every single domain of the network, from client all the way to the cloud and the application layer, and form turnkey solutions for our customers and have the global reach and scale necessary to reach more customers internationally, it's just um, the, the, the sky's the limit in terms you of know, possibilities. It's funny when you talk about turnkey though because this is one of those pendulums that swings back and forth where, remember five, six years ago, everybody wanted everything disaggregated, yeah. but now nobody can put the stuff together, yeah. right? And everyone, more and more customers, including the service providers, are looking for these turnkey solutions yeah. because infrastructure today isn't just network, it's not just servers, right. it's not just storage, it's all of it working together, yeah. right? I, so. You know, first of all, you can have turnkey end-to-end -end solutions and also be open and give your customers choice. And that's exactly what we will do. But I think as you think about the AI opportunity, and in particular networking for AI, where now you really need, or there's an, a, a, an opportunity here to offer end-to-end -end solutions that include all aspects mm -hmm. of learning and inference at the edge, all over the place, yeah, yeah. this presents that, an incredible the opportunity for the too. combined company. When you think company. about intelligent applications and a real-time re representation, digital representation of your business, yeah. people, places, and things in real time, yeah. you need a network that is so fast to yes. be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. And so reliable, and that's, that's, a, that's a new layer of, of value, of application value that's yeah. going to be developed. Well, I can't agree more, and I, I think this is ultimately the opportunity that we can pursue better as one company. Um, of course, we've got to get through the regulatory process, it's going to take a bit of time, but I, I'm really excited about the, the potential now, of this. It, so if we accept the premise that you're ahead on AI for networking because you've been doing it longer than anybody, do you feel that gives you an advantage in the networking for AI though? And we were kind of joking before the thing started that you need, one, you need AI for networking to do networking for AI yeah. because there's a lot of moving parts. And so, are you able to take your strength in the AI for networking yeah. and be able to get a, take a leadership position in networking for AI? Yeah. So, Zia says, I think it's a great question and, and I actually think it's the combination of the strength and the leadership we have in AI for networking, which absolutely is applicable to building the AI cluster data centers because ultimately you want them to be optimized, uh, self-running, just as any other network you want it to be. In but fact, also, the, the risk of doing that wrong is yeah. huge, right? It, it, it yeah. becomes astronomical when it comes to learning and inference. Add to that our pedigree in high performance networking, our silicon development capabilities, our Junos operating system, the features that we've developed to uh, mimic the capabilities of InfiniBand, that combination is incredibly yeah. powerful. Now, potentially in the future, include things like the slingshot technology that comes from HPE's uh, HPC high performance computing background. I mean, things get really yeah, exciting. High, the HPC AI combination is going to be supercomputing with networking. It's going to be a, uh, kind of the holy grail yeah. for this next gen. Question that comes up, I want to get your thoughts on. You mentioned hy hybrid, well we talked about hybrid and, and you know, public-private networks across tracking. Like cloud, we'll see a lot of hybrid stuff going on in telco markets and other networking. The, the, the comments that's coming on the internet is things like, statements like partnerships remain critical for adoption of AI solutions. Part, the partner ecosystem is developing with these solutions from silicon, you got to pick your clusters, foundation models are emerging, yeah. that has specialty around them. What is your view on how partnerships are going to work in networking and in this area? Because you're going to need to connect things. Yeah. You got to have that open gateway is a big discussion they're having as one example. Yeah. What do you see changing or evolving in how partnerships, company to company, company to customer, integration, what are some of the, the, the hot spots and the opportunities? Yeah, I mean, if I understand the question, I think what people are asking for are partnerships 
that make, that give them the comfort level and the peace of mind that when we offer an end-to-end -end solution that delivers on all aspects of AI networking, compute, storage, networking, the software, the automation, the visibility, the peace of mind that this thing is just going to work, Look, either you're going to need to have all of the components in-house that you can assemble together and yeah. pre-test, or you're going to have to have strong yeah. partnerships that will allow you to assemble these components and to test them to give your customers the confidence that yeah. it's just going to work. And on the, developer, on the developer side, how do you see the developer market emerging? AI native networking for yeah. developers, like a DevOps, or um, yeah. integrating into the applications where the, um, the network policies could be implemented. What's the developer angle on this? I mean, I, uh, pretty much any market is ripe for AI solutions <laughs> addressing. I mean, whether it be the developer market or any other market for that matter, you know, I, I do believe the opportunity is just massive and the benefits of artificial intelligence is pretty much profound across the board. Given your background in, in silicon, how, how do you see what's going on in silicon? How do you see that playing out? I mean, it's, you know, NVIDIA's two years out, you see their results growing like crazy, super high gross margin, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody else trying to get into that business. Yeah. So it seems to be a gate right now to AI acceleration. How, how do you see that playing out? Is it as much of a gate as I believe it is, or we believe it is, and, and how do you see that progressing? I mean, obviously it's, it's hard not to see what NVIDIA has done and, and be in absolute awe and respect for the technologies that they have developed and the market share that they have captured. Having said that, I think they're going to have more and more competition down the road. Pretty much yeah. all the hyperscalers are developing their own silicon. Of course, you've got AMD, you've got Intel that are coming into the mix. Um, there, there are a lot of players that are going to come in and basically compete for that GPU opportunity. On the networking side, I can say something very similar here. I believe part of what Juniper brings to the table that, is, that provides us with significant differentiation is our ability to choose the best of breed, merchant silicon where it makes sense, but then also custom silicon with specific hooks that can be very valuable for AI cluster networking that ultimately uh, build these end-to-end -end data centers. Um, silicon is going to play an incredibly important role here. It wasn't that long ago that this industry stopped believing in silicon. We felt that software defined is everything. Yeah. The, the hardware is well, meaningless. Well, white box is going to rule the world, right? Yeah, and yeah. honestly, it's a little bit of, um, it feels good to yeah. see that people have started to wake up and to realize just how important silicon is to the ultimate end state solutions that we need to offer to our customers. Is there customers? a lesson though from the success of NVIDIA though, where if you look, they have good silicon, but what they've really done is change the silicon industry where you need to deliver the software. You know, you were asking about developers, yeah. that developers can use to interact with the silicon versus yeah. here's your chips, figure out what to do with it. Look, like I said, NVIDIA has figured out the recipe and you're absolutely right, it's yeah. not just about the silicon technology, but it's a software that enables the end users, yeah. the developers, to tap into that silicon. Yeah, Ernie, that's how you've been building boxes but mm -hmm. for a long well, time. The premise is that silicon <laughs> is not going to be the gate to AI acceleration. You believe that that, that barrier goes away in the near to midterm? Is that a fair assessment? Uh, I, or? I mean, I, no, well, hold on. I, mean, I, I believe that we can never take a step back or relax and say, okay, the silicon is here. We will need to continue, continue. Yeah. to yeah. innovate and iterate with new process nodes and architectural advantages yeah. and so on sure. to stay ahead of the game. Actually, at, actually at Supercomputing 23, we just had the rise of what we call clustered systems. I mean, a clustered system is the definition, but you're starting to see the trend of clusters being built around combination of chips, like, yeah. like pairing chips with this software for workloads that, like say, GPU clouds are emerging. Yeah. That is clearly becoming a supercomputing like architecture. Correct. Let's put some clusters together. So I think we're in an era now of clustered systems as a category of building clusters and connecting with NICs and networks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which, by the way, is why it is so important to think about the silicon certainly for the performance aspects, but then also the, uh, the software that sits across all of the various different components compute storage networking and gives you the confidence that this is actually <laughs> working well as a single system, a single supercomputer, yeah. if you will. So we're, we're at a whole nother revolution, it's a systems revolution. Yes. Systems mindset is the new 
new normal, clustered systems. New, yeah. new, well, same. you said the pendulum goes back and forth. <laughs> uh, five years from now, we're going to say we want to disaggregate everything again, so. Hey, it sounds like we need a new operating system to run yeah. all this. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Rami, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Zia, yeah, for your time, you. Dave. Guys, we're live here in Barcelona, bringing you all the action on theCUBE. Four days of wall-to-wall -wall live coverage, only on theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. Thank you.